So tonight we are talking about loops. We're getting loopy tonight. Um, so what are loops? Well, first of all, and you're going to hear me talk about this for the next four weeks. Loops are first foray into reusability. Well, what is reusability? Reusability means that I can use the same block of code I write again and again and again. So we're, we're, we talked about blocks with conditionals, with branches, last week. Well, you can talk about another code block, and we're going to do a new kind of conditional this week, which is a loop, which allows me to run that code block as many times as I need to. In coming weeks, we're going to go into functions where we can actually name a code block and use it again and again and again. So why is reusability important? Well, first of all, you don't want to copy and paste code. Why don't you want to copy and paste code? Because you're just making more code for you to maintain in the future. The most efficient thing for you and the most efficient thing for a company who's most likely going to be paying you to program is to write the minimum amount of code necessary to do what you need to do correctly. So one of the ways to do that is to be able to reuse the code that you write. You structure it in such a way, you work with it in such a way that you can use it again and again and again. And so that's why reusability is important. It costs money to write code. It costs money to maintain code. Um, there is a metric, and it's basically um, if you catch a code problem in requirements, it's going to cost you a dollar. If you catch it um, in design, it's going to cost you $10. If you catch it in coding, it's going to cost $100. And if you catch it at a customer site, it's going to cost you $1,000. So that's the general increase of that metric. So the less code you can write, the more likely it is that you won't ever get to that point where it's costing you a lot of money to fix fix a problem. Um, I'm in the process of trying to prove that there's not actually a problem with my code. I've been doing it for a week and a half. Not because the code is horrible, but because there's different behavior going on. Now, we have efficient code, and there's not a massive amount of code I have to look through. But sometimes I have to prove a negative. But that's the kind of time you can take to see if your code is functioning properly or not. So reusability is important because I've got fewer lines of code than if I copied and pasted my code all over the place. So now I'll get off my reusability soapbox and go on to the next slide. Okay, so we have some new keywords this week. We have the while keyword, we have for, and we have in. While is a keyword, oh, and break and continue. We have five new keywords this week, sorry. While is basically a branch. We did if, elif, and else last week because we're making decisions. Well, this week, looping is about making the same decision repeatedly until you don't need to make that decision anymore. While and for are the keywords that we use for loops. While generally requires an exit condition to avoid infinite iterations. We will talk about sentinel values in just a couple of minutes. Four is, again, it's about making a decision repeatedly, but its exit condition is part of its decision-making process. So they have the same goal, but they have different formats and different usages. I happen to use a for loop a lot more in my work than I do a while loop. However, you guys are going to need to get really used to while loops because that is going to be your game control loop. Your game control loop, when they talk about that, it's a while loop with a sentinel value. Okay. In checks if a value is present in a sequence, in a sequence, that's what it does. You can use it in loops. You can use it in if statements. But a lot of times, most of the times, it's used in for loops. Break is a way to stop the loop. Stop it. Let's say you have an if condition that 
you know, somebody enters the letter Q, and then you're supposed to stop the loop. Well, break will do that for you. It literally halts the execution of the loop. Continue doesn't halt the execution of the loop completely. It stops what you're doing, and it goes back and allows the loop to make a new decision. So those are our five new keywords, and we have a couple new concepts. We have the concept of an iteration and the concept of a sentinel value. An iteration is one trip through the loop. So you will have the, the loop will have been evaluated to true. You will do some number of lines of code under um, inside the code block, and then it will go back up to the top of the loop to reevaluate. That execution of the code block once is an iteration. And we'll look at we'll look at some examples. The Sentinel value is a special a special value, and it is the termination condition of the loop. All loops need termination conditions because otherwise they will run forever. They will chew up all the, the computer's resources, and your computer will eventually stop. So we need to tell a loop when to stop, and that's what the Sentinel value is for. In while loops, the sentinel value is explicit. We, we put it in the while loop. In for loop, it's not as explicit, especially because a lot of times you're using a range operator or you're saying in a list, but there is still a finite amount of work that needs to be done. So first thing we're going to talk about is a while loop. While is our keyword. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to define a variable. And I'm defining the variable because I have to check the variable value against the sentinel value. And the only way to do that is to, before I write my first while loop, before that keyword while is on my screen, I need to define a variable that's going to allow me to go inside the loop, which means it's going to be, it's going to force the first iteration of the loop to evaluate to true, the first decision to evaluate to true. So then I'm going to have my while statement. Now, while is a keyword, it tells Python it's going to start making decisions repeatedly. But there's also more in this line of code than just that keyword. We have that variable again. So I defined the variable test in the line before, and I set it to go. I could have set it to x. It doesn't matter. What matters is that when I look at the condition after the while keyword, I make sure that's going to evaluate to true the first time. So I have test equal go. Now in the while loop, I have while, and then I have the variable test, same variable, and then I have my conditional operator, because this is a decision. Just like last week, we had if, elif, and else, and we had those conditional operators. Same conditional operators apply, same Boolean operators apply. So I have a conditional operator, and then I have a value. And this, in this case, Q is my value, and it is my sentinel value. It says when the condition, when this condition is met, when test is not equal to, sorry, when test finally is equal to Q, then stop. That's what it does. And you can read this, it says, as long as test is not equal to Q, keep on going. That's really how you can read this. So the only time this loop will stop is when you set test to the character Q. So what am I going to do? Well, in this case, I'm just going to have a print statement, and then I'm going to have, I'm going to set my test variable equal to some new input. Why am I going to do that? Because I need to change the value of that variable each time it goes up to the while loop so that I have something new to test. If I never changed test, inside the, the code block for that loop, my loop would be an infinite loop and it would run forever. Um, so that's why I have this input statement here. 
the input statement says input a word or cue to quit. So if I input Q and test becomes Q and I go back up to the top of the loop and test is then Q, which means the while loop will evaluate defaults, then I can continue through this loop. So we're going to look at um, a few rules. Sentinel is a value which defines the exit condition for the loop. While loop will execute until the sentinel value reaches the exit condition, sorry. And like all conditional statements, a while statement must end with a colon. Your friendly neighborhood colon. Anytime you make a decision in Python, you have to end that decision with a colon. So let's take a look and just, just follow the test. So we have our code here, test equal bow, while test is not equal to the letter Q, we're going to print something out, and then we're going to ask to change that test variable, the value in that test variable. So let's just walk through this a little bit. Oops, hit the wrong key. All right, right now test is go, so it's not Q, so we're going to go inside the while loop. So we're going to execute the print statement, and then we're going to get to test. When we get to test, it's an input statement. Somebody's got to do something. So Professor Lisa, who's going to be testing your code, is going to put in the word hello. When I put in the word hello, you will have noticed that the arrow went back up to the top of the loop, and I completed the first iteration because I am now back at that while statement. So then, I now hello is my hello. Test is now equal to hello. And what's going to happen? Same thing that happened when it equals go. I'm going to test the condition. So since test is hello, test is not equal to Q, I'm going to print something out, and then I'm going to ask somebody to input. I'm going to wait for an input. So I'm now going to change the value in the variable test. And this time I'm going to type Q because I'm done. So test is Q. Iteration 2 is complete because I'm back up to the top of the loop. And what happens? What happens is that I'm done. Test is Q, so the loop will stop. Okay? Each trip through the loop is called an iteration, and that's something important to remember because um, you have to kind of think like this when you're writing a loop. You have to think about the iterations and what's going to happen in this iter in these iterations. Right now, this is pretty simple. You've got two lines of code in a block. You're not making any other decisions inside the block. But as you get closer to your game, you're going to be making a lot of decisions inside the code block. So understanding how to think through a loop and what an iteration means and when you're going to stop and when you're going to continue is, is important. Okay, so now we're going to look at it visually. So we have test equal go. I have if test is not equal to Q. If it's true, I'm going to output test. And then I'm going to input test. And then if it's false, I'm going to stop, which means that it's true. So when you're dealing with a flowchart, because you're going to have to deal with more flowcharts in the class, you will notice the loop. from, And you'll notice I didn't say while here. In the, excuse me, in the flowchart, I said if. If test is not equal to Q. So that's really what's happening here. While is just allowing it to continue. So the box, the orange box, is really the heart of the loop. And you'll notice that with the arrows. You can follow the arrows and it makes a loop. So we're going to follow the test again, and this time we're going to watch what happens to the, um, to the flow chart when we go through this. And I'm kind of concentrating on the simple stuff right away because it's really important to get this down. So if test is go, it's not Q, it's true, so I'm going to output test, and then I'm going to input test. So I'm going to type in hello. Hello is not Q. 
it evaluates to true, I'm going to output, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to input something else. So I'm inputting Q. Q is the same as Q. So the if condition evaluates to false, and I'm done. And now I'm done with that example. Um, there we go. So let's go out here and look at some code. Um, what was that? That is while with Sentinel. That's the count. Okay, so we'll do while with Sentinel. Let me make this big. Okay, this is just a simple while loop. It's very much like we had with Sentinel. I have answer is Y. If answer is not Q, then input what is the answer. The answer is you're going to output the answer. And then we're going to, we have done with the loop. So let's edit the configuration and do uh, while wow, with Sentinel. Now, you'll notice that this one has a print statement at line 9, and I wanted to show you because line 9 is only ever going to get executed once the while loop is done. And here indentation is very important again. When you have a code block, you have to indent the code properly or you're going to have a problem. So let's debug this because we all know I like the debugger. And right now, my variables are nothing because I haven't really started. So I'm going to step over and answer is Y. Now the question here is, answer is not equal to Q, true or false. Well, that's true because Y is not equal to Q. So I'm going to step over and now I am in my code block. So I'm going to step over this. It's going to wait. I'm going to put in what is the answer. The answer is 42. I'm going to step over. Now I'm going to print. The answer is 42. I'm back up to the top of the loop. If we look at the variables, answer is 42. It's no longer y because I changed it inside the loop. And so I'm now going to Step over the while loop, answer is still 42 because I changed it to 42 inside the loop. It's going to say, what is the answer? I'm going to go to the console, and this time I'm going to say quick because we don't need to do this. I'm going to print the answer. Notice when I entered the, the value, the sentinel value to stop the program, the while loop doesn't automatically stop. It's going to keep going until it gets to the last line of code in the block. Now I'm going to go up to the while loop again. Q is in fact Q, so this is going to evaluate to false. And now when I drop out of the loop, I get to line 9. And that is the only time I get to line 9. And that's just going to say done with the loop. So what are some common errors I can get into. Well, first of all, that is a common error. Just like with the if statements, if I don't have things properly indented and I run this, I'm going to get an indentation error. Why did I get an indentation error on this one? Well, because I wasn't indented one. Okay, so I know how to fix an indentation error. I properly indent. But let me show you a logic error. That was a syntax error because Python could say, hey, there's an indentation problem. This is about to be a logic error. Now, all I did was I backspaced that print statement. So it is no longer tabbed one over. It no longer aligns with the word answer. And that means it is not in the code block. So let's see what happens when I run this through the debugger. Well, we start and our answer is Y. That's perfect. Now, while answer is not Q and Y is not Q, I'm going to say answer, input the answer. So far, everything's the same. I'm going to say 42, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. This is a logic error. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to print the answer is. 
But because this print statement is not properly indented, it is not part of the code block for that while loop and will only get executed when I exit the loop. So let me go down here. I'm just going to say Q. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And now I get to that print statement. And that is simply because the whole behavior changed because I did not have a line indented properly. So that's a logic error, and you fix the logic error by indenting it properly. So counting. The first thing we just did was we did a normal sentinel value. But sometimes you want to count. You want to count with, um, you just want to count things up. That's what you want to do, or down. Now, it's important to understand you can count with a while loop because there are times when you want to do it. However, that said, I use for loops. When I'm counting, I use for loops almost all of the time. In fact, I use for loops almost all of the time anyway. I don't use them, um, yeah, I don't use while loops very much at all. I use for loops because I'm usually going over a finite bit of information. But when we'll get to that in a minute. But we're counting with a while loop. So now here we have some different code. I have my test value, which is going to be counter. I'm setting it equal to zero because I want to start at zero. And I'm saying while counter is less than three, I'm going to print out what counter is. And then I'm going to increment the counter. And that is when I say counter equal counter plus one. Now, in this kind of thing where I'm not actually physically sitting at the keyboard, Professor Lisa is not changing an input, you have to make sure you increment that counter or you will get into a situation where you have another infinite loop and you don't want to do that. So, counter is the test value. Counter is zero, which is less than three, so you're going to execute the code inside the loop. And then I'm going to go back to the top of the loop. Counter's been changed already. It is now two. Five, oh, that's kind of fast. Sorry. Let's go back to that one a little slower. Okay. So we have counter. Counter is zero, which is where we're going to be able to get into the loop. So it is less than three. We then go print out. We say counter equal counter plus one. When we increment the counter, it turns out to be 1, and we go back up to the top of the loop. 1 is less than 3. We go down, we increment the counter. 2 is still less than 3. We increment the counter to 3. And at the point where it is 3, we stop because 3 is not less than 3 anymore. So this is how you count with a while. And the important part here is you don't have someone sitting and entering anything you are allowing the loop to increment, to self, to self increment. To, the iterations are not being controlled by a person. They're being controlled by something finite. So you have to remember, when I just talked about that logic error with the print, if you take and move counter and don't indent it properly, you're going to create an infinite loop because one will never be incremented. Sorry, counter will never be incremented. Okay, so now we're going to get into for loops because for loops are my bread and butter. I use for loops almost all the time. So what's important about a for loop? For loops basically make the decision over a finite set. Okay, so the finite set can be a, a list. You can do it over a dictionary if you get the keys. You can do it over a range of numbers. And range here, we're going to have, we have a whole slide on range. So what do I have in the line of code in front of me? Well, first of all, what I don't have. In the while loops, I always had to define that variable before the start of the while loop. I don't have to do that now because it happens automatically in the for statement itself. So this is the first time 
where we're kind of defining a variable at the same time we're making a decision. That's very handy and it also goes to writing less code. You want to choose the correct loop for the correct type of problem. And so I could define num outside and say zero, but I don't need to because Python's going to do it for me. So I have my four keyword. Four basically says you're about to make a decision repeatedly. Then I have num. Num is just the name of a variable. It could have been Fred. It could have been X. It's just the name of a variable. That's all it is. However, it has to be there. A variable name has to be in that place. I don't have to have defined the variable anywhere else. In fact, I probably shouldn't. And Python's going to define that for me, and it's going to take care of setting num. And num only exists within that for loop. It goes away after the for loop. You can't do anything with it, and I'll show you the kind of error that you get when that happens. Now I have my keyword in. In just tells Python to expect a sequence. They are some, it can be a, it can be a list with all kinds of things in it. It could be a dictionary. It can be a range. And a range is just a function in Python that creates a sequence. A sequence of numbers, but a sequence. Very handy, and it's, it's kind of the way, if you're going to count something down in Python, that's kind of the way to do it. Um, and range has its own slide. The way you read this statement is, as long as num is less than three, keep going. Because three, is not inclusive. You always, with range, unless you tell it differently, you start at zero, you end at a number, and it's not inclusive of that number because you want to go zero, one, two is three numbers, if that makes sense. So then we're going to have something in our print, in our, inside the block. This is a code block. And you'll notice that that's all I need. I don't need, um, oh, that should have been three there, sorry. Every time we go through this loop, we're going to print the number out, and then Python's going to automatically increment num for us. We don't have to do anything. When we looked at that while loop, let's see, go back. We look at the while loop, we have one, two, three, four lines of code to count to three. And I'm going to change this real quick to three. And in our code here, we have two. I just cut my number of lines in code in half by using Python to do something efficiently. So now we're going to talk about range. Range and in, OK? Range is a function provided by Python, and it basically creates a sequence for you. That's what it does. You have a start, a stop, and an increment. Now, you'll see that I said optional and required there. The only thing you have to have in a range is the stop place. Start is always assumed to be zero unless you tell it differently, and increment is always assumed to be one unless you tell it differently. So when I said range and I have three as the argument, I am saying start at zero, increment by one until I am, as long as I'm less than three. That's what it does. And you can even do range to go backwards, but this is what range does. And again, I wrote half the lines of code in the for loop that I did in the while loop. And in is a keyword, and it has a couple of purposes. It's to determine a value is contained, contained in a sequence, and it iterate, it helps through the iteration through the sequence. So you, you will be using in again when we get to lists and dictionaries. But for right now, in is used to tell us whether or not 
the value of, in this case, num is inside the sequence created by range. Am I talking gobbledygook yet? So we're going to follow the number, and then I'm going to do some examples in code. So here's my two lines of code. And you'll notice that you don't need Professor Lisa for this. So no teacher needed. Range. What does range do? This is what range does. That range statement says 0, 1, and 2. So it has created a sequence of three numbers. And those three numbers, 0, 1, and 2, there's no um, magic about it creating 0, 1, and 2 because that's exactly what we told to do when we called range with the number 3. Again, if you don't tell it otherwise, it starts at 0 and it will create three numbers, or six, or 12, or however many you put in that range. Now, when I first start the loop, zero is num, because that's what Python does for me, OK? And num, zero is in range of three, so it's there. So I'm going to print num is, and in this case, zero. And I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. When I go back up to the top of the loop, what's Python going to do? What Python's going to do is it's going to now take 1, and 1 is going to be assigned to num. And then I'm going to print it out, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. Well, you guessed it. Now Python for me is going to assign 2 to num. Num is still in range of 3. And it's going to print it out. And then I'm done. I'm just done. I'm not, there's no sequence left. So Python says, OK, you're done. And that's all that there is to it. That's a lot of stuff for two lines of code. You get a lot of stuff with a for loop. OK, so we're going to go through a flow chart, and then we're going to go through some code. So this is just the same thing. Num is 0. If num is less than 3, I'm going to print stuff out. I'm going to increment the number. And then if it's false, I'm going to end. Now, why am I showing you this? And why in the world did I, did I just say num equals num plus 1? Because flowcharts are language agnostic. They do not take into account the slick things languages can do for you, like for, in, and range. So when you're dealing with a visual tool, like a flowchart, you ignore those special things that the language can do, and you instead define the logic. So that's what I've done here. This, there's a loop, and it looks very much like a while loop. Why does it look like a while loop? Well, because flowcharts are language agnostic. It doesn't know the difference between a for and a while. That is why in that diamond there is the word if. So when you look at a flowchart sometime in the future, don't assume that the loop is a for loop or a while loop or maybe some other kind of keyword that a language I don't know has. Okay, So that's the reason to show you this particular flowchart so that you can realize the flow looks the same. It's just that Python is giving us a lot of cool stuff. OK. Um, let's go and look at some code, and then we'll deal with range a little more. Yes. So you can define num outside the loop if you need to. OK. Um, you would not put num there, Stephen. You would just do three, but in a minute I'm going to show you what happens if we do put values there. You're probably not going to want to ever, you don't want to use the same variable that you use in as the, the for loop test variable. But we'll take a look and see what happens when we put other stuff there. So let's go down here. And I'm going to open um, four with range. 
Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, that's a while. That is another while. And we can go through any of these when you want. I don't know why they spend so much time on while when four is what is what I use most anyway. So this is 4.5.1, but a little bit extra. So I did this because I wanted to um, I wanted to show you kind of different ways of doing things. So first of all, I'm going to have a four in stock price, and then I'm going to have a four in range, the length of stock price, and then I'm going to have a four in range, the length of stock price minus one, and I'm going to go backwards. So these are just all things you can do with four, and I thought that this particular challenge was a good a good way to do that. So I am going to set my configuration. What did I call that? Challenge four five one. Challenge. There we go. Four five one. And I'm going to debug because we all know I love the debugger. So I'm going to enter stock prices. I'm going to say 150, 250, and 100. Up space, 100. Okay. So I have four stock prices. I can see that I have four stock prices in my variables. And... Um, Stock price, it didn't split. Oh, I was splitting on a comma. Let me stop and start again. Okay, I didn't look at my split here. It was a comma and I used spaces. So let's do this again. And we're gonna say 150, 250, 100. Okay, so now I actually have a list, which is what I wanted. So I put in three, three um, stock prices. And so now I'm going to do a 4 in stock price. So now if I look down here at my variables and I step over, all of a sudden you see price right here. Because Python's done all that for me. It's taken the first value out of stock price, it's put it in price, and I'm just going to print it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll show it in the console. I'm just printing my stock prices. Now, I want to try something a little different. I'm going to say LM in range, zero length, stock price. And then I'm going to do the same thing, but with a list. I know we haven't done much with lists, but I just wanted to show you the difference. And now I'm going to go backwards through that. So I can go 100. So that is all the things I can do with just a little bit of four in and range. So where am I? A little bit more about range. That's what I wanted to start on. Okay, so I want to print every other number between one and five inclusive of five. So I want to make sure five is the last number. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to say 4num in range. Now my range is different now. I have a start, a stop, and an increment. And so my start is at 1. So I'm not going to start at 0 on this one. I'm going to start at 1. I'm going to end at 1 minus, sorry, 6 minus 1. So I'm inclusive of 5. And I am going to skip I'm only going to do every other one because this time I want odd numbers for whatever reason. So what's going to happen is num is going to be 1. I'm going to print num is and num is 1. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. What's going to happen at the top of the loop? Well, I'm going to use 3 because range has already calculated for me that 1 plus 2 is 3. So num is 3. Now 3 plus 2 is 5. So num is going to become 5. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. 5 plus 2 is 7. And I'm done. 
And I did that by only changing a couple of values in range. Nothing else changed. So nested loops. OK. So here is, let's see, do I want to do anything other than forward range? We've done that. Index out of bounds. OK. Okay, so I'm going to just keep talking. Nested loops. You can have a loop inside of a loop, inside of a loop, inside of a loop. You can have as many depths as you need to. Now, if you've got a lot of depths in your for loop, you've probably got a lot of complexity, and you want to design out some of that complexity. But for now, we're only going to deal with a nested loop. And the nested loop is important for comma-separated value files. So this is going to lead to something that you're going to have to do when we start dealing with files, which is comma-separated value files, and rows and columns, and a matrix. So this is basically from challenge 4.1.3. That's not right. Um, I'll find the right challenge number. So we have two loops here. We have an outer for loop and an inner for loop because I want to print rows and columns. And this is how you deal with matrices in Python or in most programming languages, at least the ones I know about. So I have rows is input the number of rows and columns. I want to input the number of columns. And so I have two numbers. I'm going to have two for loops. The outer for loop is the rows, and the inner for loop is the columns. And what I want to do is I want to print a star. But I don't want to print a star and then a new line every time. I only want to print a star and a space. And then when I'm done with all the columns, I then want to print a new line before I go back up to the outer loop. So let's see how this works. There we go. So Professor and Lisa enters two for the number of rows and two for the number of columns. And that's just because I only have so much room on this slide. So my outer is going to be zero. And I am now I'm going into my first code block, and the first line of my first code block is another for loop, which is completely OK. So the inner is 0. So I've start, got outer is 0 and inner is 0. Now I'm going to print a star followed by a space. Now you'll notice that I didn't go down to that print that print with just nothing in it. And that's because that will not get hit until I am done with the inner loop. So I'm going back up to the top of the inside loop. Now inner is 0 plus 1, which is 1. And you'll notice I haven't done anything to outer. Outer is still 0 because I haven't made it up to the top of the outside loop. I'm still working on that inside loop. So now I'm going to print my star again with a space. I am now back up to the top of the inner loop. 1 plus 1 is 2, which means I'm done because 2 is, you know, I'm the range is 2, 2, so it's going to be 0 and 1. So now I go outside that inner loop, and I'm going to say print, which is going to be a new line. And then after print, I go up to the for, I go up to the outer loop, and now I'm going to, I've just erased everything from the inner loop. I've got my print statements, but the inner loop is done. It's, it's just gone for now. So now I'm going to say out, outer equals outer plus one, and I go back into my inner loop. And then I start it all over again. Enter is 0. I'm going to print a star. 
I'm going to go up to the top of my inner loop. Inner. Wait a minute, where'd it go? There we go. We're going to print another star, go back up to the top of the loop. I'm at two, so I'm done. I then print a new line because I'm now outside the inner loop. I go up to the top of the outer loop. It's two, so I'm done. And I'm done with the program. So that's a nested loop. And a lot of times students get a loop really quickly and then you start to add the complexity of an inner loop and that whole iteration gets kind of jumbled. But it doesn't have to be if you look at them as separate loops, but one, the inner loop is dependent on the outer loop. So anybody want to see more nested loops? Because I think we probably should. So nested four. Okay. This is the same thing. I could have done it for five or ten or whatever I needed to do. So let's just do uh, nested four. Okay, nested four. So I am going to input two values. Let's debug this. I'll make it bigger. And I'm just going to make it a three by three now. So I'm going to step over. The console is waiting. I'm going to say three. The console is waiting again. Oops. Not quite yet. Console is waiting again. I'm going to say three. So I have a three by three. So let's take a look at what the variables show us. We have val1 is three and val2 is three. When I step in to the first loop, outer is zero. I'm just going to print outer because I want us to keep track of where we are. And then inner is Inner in range 0 to val2. I didn't need the 0, but it doesn't hurt to have it. So inner, we see down here, is 0 and outer is 0. So I'm going to print inner with a space. So inner is 0, and I've just printed it. Outer is still 0. So now inner is 1. I'm going to print inner with a space. Inner is 2, I'm going to print inner with the space, and now I'm at 3, so I'm out of range. So I'm going to finish, say finished outer, sorry, should have been inner iteration, and I'm going to back up to the top of the loop. So I'm going to say outer is now 1, so outer has finally incremented, inner I'm just going to do starts over at zero again because that's what I told it to do. And then I'm going to print one. I'm going to print two. I'm going to print finished. Now I am outer is going to be two. So I'm now back at inner and inner is again at zero. It, it resets every time. And then I'm going to print zero, one, two, and finished. And then I'm completely done. So that is a nested for loop. We can also do nested while loops. Now you'll notice that um, I have an outer helper and an inner helper. And the difference with a nested while loop is that you have to define the variables at the right time. Whereas I didn't have to worry about defining any variables with a for loop. With a while loop, I do. So I have my outer helper here, which is going to be my counter, and my inner helper here, which is going to be my inner while loop counter. Now the problem is that if I defined this outside here, my, my, my looping wouldn't work right. So let's see how it works now, and then let's see how it works when it's not working right. Because again, this would be a logic error. It wouldn't be a syntax error. So let us do nested while. Oops. Okay. Let's go 
look at nested while loop and take a look at how things are. Now, there's not going to be any user input here. There's no, you know, Professor Lisa adding anything. I'm just doing this for three because for right now it works with the example. So I'm going to debug. I'm going to go to my variables. I see outer helper is zero. I go into the while loop because zero is less than three. I now have inner helper, which is getting defined inside the outer while loop. So they're both zeros. So inner helper is less than three because it's zero. And I'm going to print and then I'm going to increment. Okay, so all I did was print this outer is zero and inner is zero. So I'm going to increment inner helper. And one is less than three. You'll notice that outer helper hasn't changed yet. Inner is less than three. So I'm going to print out. And I'm an increment helper. Now helper is two. I'm going to print out my statement. I'm going to increment helper. Helper is now three. So I now increment outer helper. And only now does outer helper get incremented. So all of these have been with outer helper zero. And inner helper is the only one that has changed. So now I go back in to the code block for my outer loop. Inner helper, which was three, goes back to zero because I am setting it to zero at this point. Inner helper is less than three, so I'm going to increment just like I did before, but you'll notice that outer helper is now one. And when I get to three, I'm done. I increment outer helper, outer helper is two. I go into inner helper, I do my three, I get to outer helper, and I'm done. Okay? So that's how you do an inner while. Now, a logic error that a lot of people do when they do while loops or when they have a language that requires that you um, that you have that you actually define your counters is they put the inner counter outside the outer while loop. So let's see what happens. Let's see what's different. So we have inner and outer as zero. So I'm going to say while. Everything seems to be working just the same. I get the first, second, and third just fine. It's identical to the first one. So now I say outer helper equals one. So now outer helper is one, but inner helper is still three. Inner helper is still three. It didn't reset to zero. And it didn't reset to zero because I didn't tell it to. I didn't define it inside the outer while loop to tell it to reset to zero. So I'm just going to increment, going to increment again, and then I'm done. So there are six more print statements that didn't happen because I simply moved inner helper. This is a logic error. To do this correctly, you want to go and do that. So let's see. Break. Break is really fun. Break is good. And you're going to need to learn to use break. And you're going to need to learn continue for your game. And we're going to do that. And we're going to do continue next. So we have a test variable because we're using a while loop in this case. It could be a four, but we're using a while for right now. And my test is, my test variable is not equal to done. So as long as I don't have test equaling done, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to input what's the answer. If it's time, if time is in test, then I'm going to print, I don't have a clock. If 42 is in test, then I'm going to put right answer, and I'm going to stop at the right answer. Otherwise, I'm going to say try again, and I'm going to go up to the top of the loop, and I'm going to ask for user input. Now, this is very similar in structure to what your game will be doing. You will have an outside while loop. You will have to answer. The first thing you will do is, is ask the user for their input. What room are they going to move to? What direction are they going to move? Then you're going to test those answers 
And your first test will probably be to make sure that they're not invalid answers. And then when you get the right answer, or in this case, um, you know, you may break, you may continue. So let's just look through this for a second. I'm going to say test, going into the while loop like I've done before. Professor Lisa says 42. Time is not in test. So I'm doing an, that was an if, I'm doing an elif. 42 is in fact in test. That's true. I'm going to print right answer and I'm going to break. And when I break, I'm done. So does anybody have any questions? Or I, I get concerned when we start to get into this part of the class that I lose a lot of students or that we lose a lot of students because some of these concepts aren't easily concrete. So I want to make sure that you guys are following. So if you're not following, there's no shame. Put it in the comments and we'll figure it out. So, okay. I assume break breaks out of the code block only. That is correct, Harold. It only breaks out of the current block that you're in. So even if you have if you have a break in an inner loop and you use break, it's only going to break out of that inner loop. It's going to take you back out to the top of the outer loop. So it only is for that local loop that you're in. Okay, continuous, not similar, but not completely similar. So basically, continue allows you to go back up to the top of the loop without doing anything. It says stop here, return to the top of the loop, and do and reevaluate what you're doing. So in this case, I have my stir, and it's one and two and three, and I'm going to split that into a list, one and two and three. And then I'm going to use for item in range length of my list, oh, sorry, that should have just been in my list. Let me fix that, that's just wrong, my apologies. In my list, boy, I don't know where my brain was. Okay, let's do this again. So, Meister is 1 and 2 and 3. I'm going to split it in 1 and 2 and 3. I'm going to say 4 item in my list, and that's just going to go and it's going to take the first element, the second element, and the third element. So, item right now is going to be 1. If item is the same as and, it's going to continue, and it's not. Otherwise, it's going to print item. Okay? So, I'm going to print item and then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. Now item becomes and. I am going to then go in and item is and so I'm going to continue so I go back up to the top of the loop. Item is now two. So it is not and so I'm going to print it. Item is and, same thing happened as before. I'm going to continue. Continue takes it up to the top of the loop. And finally, item is three. I'm I, Three is not and, so it's going to print and end. So let's take a look at a little bit of code. We'll break. Uh, so, Dylan, the break will break out of the loop that you're currently in. So, on, I can do a real, once we're done talking about, I'll talk about the lab since we're getting, we're at 10. And then I can go back and I can show you some examples if that would help. So, I'm going to just go through the labs really quick. So, lab 4.14. This is where you're going to have a loop with some things you need to do inside the loop. And what you need to do is you need 
to output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, and commas. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to keep a counter. And that counter is going to have to be incremented when you find um, when you find a space, a period, or a comma, you're going to continue. Otherwise, you're going to count it. So what you basically have is you're going to go through the string. So if um, you're less than the length of a string, you're going to check if it's a space. If it's not a space, you're going to increment it. Then you're going to, if, if it is not a space, you're going to go and do an LF because these have to be mutually exclusive. And you're going to say, is it a period? If it's not a period, you're going to go back down and you're going to say, is it a, a comma? And if it's not, if all of those are false, then you go up and you increment counter and you go back and you look at the next string. And then at the end, you're going to output it. So that's pretty much it. You've got a for loop with three if elif statements. And there is there will also be on the YouTube site posted the uh, pseudocode. So this is, I don't know why not everything's there. Um, here, let me just click some buttons. OK. So we're just going to do it this way. So lab 4.15 is a little bit, um, it's a little longer, but it encompasses some of the same things as 4.14. What you're doing is you're going to have a word, some of you are going to input a word, you're going to have a counter and a password, okay? So you're and you're going to basically create um, a couple of passwords and you're going to also make sure that you were to create that password you're going to replace certain characters with other characters so an i becomes a, an exclamation point an a becomes an at an m becomes a capital m b becomes eight and zero becomes stop so how do you do that well you build up a string while you are in a loop so basically for counter less than the length of a word, um, you're going to check the value. Is the value of the character you are currently on in that string an I? If it is an I, then you're going to, the password is going to then be appended with an exclamation point. If it's an A, it's going to be appended with the at. If it's an M, it's going to be appended with a capital M. We come back over here because there's not a lot. If it's a B, it's appended with an A. If it's an O, it's appended with a dot. Otherwise, it's appended with the, the, um, the word value itself. We go back up and do it again. So this is a much, partly because of the size of the slide, a little more convoluted looking loop. But you just do that for every single character. And when you're done, you output the password. So if the counter of if the counter is longer than the word, then the length of the word, then you're done. Or actually it's the length of the word minus one, then you're done. So that's lab 4.15. 4.16 is a little different. Um, you're going to output a right angle based on the specified triangle height and a symbol. So you're going to input a character, you're going to input height, and then what you're going to do is you're going to check the height. And here's where you have an inner loop and an outer loop. Okay? So that's why it was kind of important just for this module to understand inner and outer loops. So the outer loop is going to be rows, it's going to be the height, and the inner loop is going to be the width. So if your counter is less than or equal to height, the height, then you're going to define an inner, like we did with while, but it's more like a for loop. Um, you're, you're going to make sure that your inner is now set to one. And then as long as enter 
inner is less than the counter, you're going to output a character, you're going to increment inner, you're going to go back up. And you're going to do this as long as you are less than the counter of the while loop. When that evaluates to false, you're going to output, you're going to increment the counter of the outer loop, you're going to output a new line, and you're going to go back and do it again. So this is, unfortunately, it's kind of squished on here, but this is an inner loop and an outer loop. And remember, the flow chart does not tell you whether it's a for or a while. You need to decide that. Okay. Was the last flow chart missing an A? Oh, probably. My bad. Was it missing an A? Uh, a at. No, A and at. Is that what you were talking about? Uh, at the end before printing. Q and S. Did I say Q and S? Oh, I think I did. What did 4.51 say? Let's go look. Okay. Uh, 4.15. Password modifier. No, 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 it's fine because they input my password. There's no Q. M Y P at S S W R D. There, uh, oh, wait a minute. By appending Q star S to the end. You're right. I did forget that. My bad. So I will go and change that right now. So before it prints out, Oh, that's going to be hard to fit. I'll put word. Okay. So, yeah, I shouldn't have done it quite like that. Let's see. Can I make that higher? I can. Um, make this a little higher. Make that a little higher. Yeah, there's a lot of lines here. Sorry about that. Just okay. All right. Um, there we go. So what I want to do is here. I want to say password plus equals two star s. We'll just do this, and then this will be right, and I'll post the right one. Uh. Yeah, false. Oops. And then here. Thank you for catching that. That is semi readable. The only problem with doing flowcharts on uh, spreadsheets, or sorry, on PowerPoint presentations. Thank you very much, Harold. I appreciate that. Okay, and then this is. Second to last, we just did that. And then here is 4.17. And this is basically, you're going to write a program that takes a string, an integer, as the input and outputs the sentence using the input values as shown in the example. Uh, the program repeats until the input string is quit. Sounds like a job for a while loop to me. So we're going to input words, we're going to input, um, you're going to split them, you're going to set a counter, you're going to say as long as it's not quit, then we're going to output per side books, we're going to input words, we're going to split them, we're going to go back up to the top. And we're going to keep doing that until Zybooks says quit. So the output per per Zybooks is just because their output string was kind of long. But that's really what 4.17 is. 4.17 is how do you use a while loop. So that's basically the material. Would anybody like to see anything? We can unmute it. Um, Python, um, it does have the concept of a do while. So you can enter the loop without having to do 
um, a check at the beginning. It, the syntax is kind of a little different than what a normal do while would be that you would use, but um, it does have the concept of entering the loop without having to meet a condition. So yes, you could eliminate two purple boxes, um, but I don't use do while loops. I don't use while loops a lot, but I don't use do while loops that much. There are some people, some programmers I know who love them, um, but I just, it's just an extra word to type when I'm actually getting into the code. So does anybody have any questions? No problem, Harold. I appreciate uh, you asking. So we can take it off of mute if anybody wants to, or we can call it a night. I'll leave that up to you guys. Okay, going once. Looks good to me. All right, cool. If any, nobody else has any questions then no problem, Daniel. I'm going to call it and I will put this up uh, tomorrow. I won't be late this time. So I'm going to end the recording and end the meeting.